as Nigeria beholds another transition in its journey of democracy. What's Nigeria's position in the global status quo? Welcome to Question Time. I'm Benga Ashiru. You can also be part of this conversation by sending us your comments on our various social media platforms showing on your screen. As commendations keep tumbling in on Nigeria's peaceful conduct of the 2015 elections, and particularly the political maturity displayed by gladiators in Nigeria's political space. Now, in the international frontier, where Nigeria plays a leading role as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, what are the gains for Nigeria? Were the scars of the missing Chibo girls still fresh in our living memory? Is there still hope that these girls can be reunited with their loved ones? How does the UN Resolution 2151 on security sector reforms affect Nigeria's national interest? In our beach said the record straight, Channel TV had a chat with Nigeria's permanent representative to the UN in New York, Professor Joy Ogu. Like Shakespeare, she sees the UN as an epicenter of a world stage with a script of seven succeeding generations from the scourge of war. So going into the heart of the story, on your assumption of, as the president of the United Nations Security Council, quite a huge expectation trailed your appointment. And um, this is the time to ask, what has been the gain so far for Nigeria's national interest? Well, it's difficult to quantify. But I want to put your concept of gain in a wider context. The wider context is that the world is a stage. In fact, Shakespeare wrote about this uh, 500 years ago. He said that all the world is a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and each man in his act plays many parts. Visualize the world as a stage and the UN as the epicenter. And all 193 member states and the Secretariat and the observer missions, the Palestine observer mission, the Holy See observer mission, and all other international organizations as the actors on the stage. There is one script. The script is to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war that is following the end of the Second World War. We needed a global context in which to place all those challenges that, the, that caused the First World War and the Second World War. And that is why, if you remember, on the 16th of April, we convened a debate on the fight against genocide. Incidentally, it was the 20th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsis in Rwanda. The idea was to remind the entire world that there will be zero tolerance for such barbarism in the 21st century. After the Second World War, the idea was that it will never happen again. But history keeps repeating itself. Because people never learn lessons. They never learn the lessons of history. And so there's one genocide after the other in many parts of the world, in Eastern Europe, in Africa. And today, the conflict in Sudan must be contained. In the Central African Republic, it must be concerned contained. So the wider context is to ensure global peace and security. And who says that any nation is isolated from conflict? No nation can live in isolation. 
other than trade and other diplomatic interactions, there is also peace and stability. Without peace, development cannot take place. Without security, development cannot take place. So that is the context that we must provide for us to achieve our development objectives and our development aspirations. That is why we cannot be isolated. You cannot ask, what are the gains? The gains are enormous. And conflict in one part of the world has reverberations in other parts of the world. Don't say, well, I'm self-contained. No. When you begin to have a conflict in one area, the displaced persons, internally displaced persons alone will, will, will swallow another the neighboring state and far beyond your imagination. So we are all together on the stage. We are all actors on the stage and we must act our part with commitment with diligence, with dedication, and with a determination that we must create a secure environment for development to take place. And the developed, relatively developed countries know this. And that's why you have foreign aid and the rest of them. They know that if they don't make this sacrifice and contribution, they will be the losers because they have to fight to fend off intrusions into their own society. You can't prevent, you can't, you can't build a wall now, um, to prevent people from coming in. Permit me to come in at this point. Uh, in a rather dramatic twist, during your reign as the president of the United Nations Security Council, back home in Nigeria, we had a rather uh, shocking occurrence which was the abduction of the 234 girls. As the President of the United Nations Security Council, how did you react to this development? Well, as you remember, I'm not sure you arrived before then, uh, we put out a press statement condemning such acts such terrorist acts, especially the abduction of girls. This community is very determined that the girl child must be protected. And incidentally, we convened an open debate on women and peace and security under the, the larger rubric and as a sub theme, the prevention of sexual assault against women. Resolution 1325 is a broad spectrum re uh, resolution that is binding on all nations that violence against women is violence against humanity. So to take these girl children, abduct them from their school is a violation, a gross violation against not only womanhood, but against humanity. And perpetrators will be made accountable for such acts. And the international opinion is that it must not be tolerated. One of the major resolutions passed during your tenure is the SSR, that's the Security Sector Reform Resolution 2151. So how does that uh, impact on Nigeria's policy? Yeah. Security sector reform uh, has been a preoccupation uh, in this mission since 2009. Uh, we had uh, cooperation with South Africa on security sector reform, and then it became a biennial event. Uh, South Africa was just emerging from conflict. We 
they uh, had been in peace in peace time, but we needed to change uh, security sector architecture. And during our presidency in 2011, we were able to negotiate what we call PRST. PRST is in the um, presidential statement of the Security Council, delineating the terms of security sector reform. And during this come back to the council, uh, we were determined to have a resolution emanate from this. And I believe that uh, is a milestone, not only for the United Nations, but also for post-conflict societies and for Nigeria. As a post-conflict phenomenon, you know, there's always a total breakdown of order, of the rule of law following the conflict. And what is needed first and foremost is to reform and reorientate the entire security sector architecture. Because in the absence of the rule of law, in the absence of peace and security, development it is impossible for development to take place. They need to reform the police, they need to reform the armed forces who had gone their separate ways. They need to reform their justice system. So that we thought on reflection that it is not only post-conflict environments that need security sector reform that security sector reform could also be a preventive strategy to conflict. And this idea was really welcomed by the entire community because peacekeeping is beginning to cost a lot of money. And if we can find ways to short circuit the concept of peacekeeping, and look for preventive ways, preventive strategies to conflict. And so that was why we were greatly encouraged. We need security sector reform in the armed forces to meet contemporary needs in the police and every security sector at home. Take, for example, the relationship with the police. That's just an example. The police must be seen as